Good morning. Welcome to this morning's virtual breakfast. My name is Eric Anderson. I'm a field crops educator. I am located down in the southwest portion of the state. Uh, with us this morning is Christy Spray. She is one of our field crop weed specialists and she's going to talk about early season weed control a little bit later on this morning. We'll hear from Jeff Van Treesen. Here's our agricultural meteorologist. Tell us a little bit about what we have coming up this coming week. Uh, Phil Cates would like to make an announcement quick. Good morning, everyone. Uh, in the past, the virtual breakfasts have not been eligible for restricted use pesticides, but as of today, anyone that is on today and views this uh, session with the virtual breakfast will be eligible for restricted use pesticide credits. What's going to happen is that we're going to have for two virtual breakfasts, that's equal to one restricted use pesticide. It's either going to be commercial core, private core, or 1A. We'll have a, a review, not a review, but a receive a code at the end of this session. And once we stop the recording, I will have that for everyone. It'll be a code word that you need to write down and that you need to have. And I'll have a lot more information next week. This has just been finalized with Michigan Department of Ag and Rural Development yesterday. I will have full details next week and articles in the MSUE News to go along with this. But your name, seminar code, certification number, all those will be emailed to my email address and then we will submit those to uh, MDARD for publication or to them to verify. So that's a uh, a pretty big thing for us because we know that many producers want to have uh, pesticide credits. So I'm going to stop sharing. All right, great. Thanks, Phil. That's good news. So Christy, thanks for joining us. I'll turn things over to you. Thanks, Eric, and uh, good morning, everyone. So um, I think over the last couple of days, some of us some of us have seen some snow flurries, so that kind of gets us thinking about, oh, are we ever going to get spring? Uh, one of the things I did want to do today is kind of just kind of give you some historical perspective on where we've been um, over the last few years about this point in time. Um, and I know Jeff will talk quite a bit about the weather, but I just wanted to, from a weed control standpoint, kind of give you an idea of how, um, where we've been at from a growing degree standpoint and maybe why some of those weeds look like they're not growing a whole lot. So this is over the last four years, kind of giving growing degree days up until um, yesterday afternoon. And you can see we've been pretty low compared to um, in 2017. So over the last few years, we've been pretty cool. And that's really affected some of our uh, field operations. Um, I haven't been able to drive around most of the state like uh, probably most of us haven't. But uh, yesterday, we were able to go up to the uh, Saginaw Valley Research and Education Center and do, do a little bit of work. And on the way up there, we have seen some spring tillage. Um, I know I've had some questions on uh, potential burn down applications. And then really there's been some more questions about wheat herbicide applications. So today I'd like to spend a little bit of time touching on some of these different things and really what we need to be thinking about as we start moving into spring. Well, hopefully uh, we get some good news from Jeff today and. Uh, maybe hopefully see that rise of warmer temperatures. And with those warmer temperatures, we are gonna see some increased weed growth. And as we see that, and depending on what the, uh, the weather is, um, you know, we might be uh, having some competition for some of our different field operations. And whether that's kind of thinking about trying to get some crops in the ground and planting, or um, really think focusing on weed control. And what I'm really trying to get you to think about is that weed control is extremely important to making sure that you get a good um, a crop throughout the season. So that early season weed control is definitely important. And um, I know some of the fields that I've seen, we've got quite a bit of uh, purple dead nettle that's in um, fields that are around. I've seen a lot of chickweed this year. And we're kind of on the earlier side of seeing some of that spring emergence of horse weed or mare's tail. So um, we know it's going to be a problem this year, and we'll talk about some of the ways that we can maybe focus on trying to get these things controlled. So uh, number one, we want to start clean. And again, early season weed control is extremely important. And it's very important in whatever crop you're planting. But um, obviously, one way we can start clean is by tillage. Um, other things we can do is making sure that we have a good effective burn down herbicide. And then also just want to bring into uh, 
a fact that, hey, if we're talking about tillage to start with early season weed control, we do need to make sure that we're ripping up those weeds, so some sort of uniform disturbance of those top few inches. And that's really what's going to help us from um, a weed control standpoint. I know a lot of us are using some vertical tillage tools. A lot of times these are not very effective at controlling existing vegetation, in particular things like mare's tail. So um, if you're going to be using those, a lot of times you do still need to have some sort of an effective burn down to control the weeds that are there because we're just not going to get those with um, tillage with some of those tools. So just kind of keep that in mind. And we're going to talk about why this early season weed control is extremely important. And the main reason for that is if we delay our uh, burn down herbicide applications, um, whether we're no-till or you know, not getting good, good weed control, what it does is it really affects our soybean yield at the end of the season. So um, just wanted to put up one data slide really showing what effect um, those weeds early in the season can have on soybeans. And this was some work that we did several years ago looking at um, making burn down applications after at planting versus after planting when soybeans were either at the unifoliate stage or when they had one or uh, three trifoliates. And you can see we do see a stairwise effect on how much yield we can reduce at the end of the season. So that early season weed control is extremely important. And you can see what that range is anywhere from waiting um, until those soybeans are up at that unifoliate stage, we can lose as much as four bushels per acre. And if we go all the way out to the third trifoliate stage, what that can do is actually equate to um, as much as a $65 an acre loss. So again, starting clean is extremely important. And we kind of did some calculations, and if we kind of looked at it on a per day basis, what that really showed is you could lose up to a quarter bushel per acre per day by waiting on that early on that burn down application. So again, starting clean is extremely important. As we move into 2020, um, you know, some of that early season weed control is really going to take effect with some of the issues that we saw last year. So in particular, mare's tail or horseweed, that's going to be one of those weeds that we're going to have to deal with. So we really need to think about planning for how do we get control of that weed. And I'm just going to give you a few hints in soybeans and tell you where you can get some more information. And the main reason for this is because we know that most of our mare's tail across the state of Michigan is resistant to glyphosate or Roundup. And many of those um, are also resistant to the ALS inhibiting herbicides. So it really gives us very few options if we're growing Roundup Ready or non-GMO soybeans from a post-emergent standpoint. Now with some of the new soybean traits, we've got some more options and we'll talk a little bit about what some of those options are, but we do have some good information on fact sheets that uh, I will direct you to um, to be able to give you some more uh, just definitive answers on how you might be able to use some of these new soybean traits for control. So just wanted to put a quick uh, option slide up there from a potential spring burn down treatment that you could use and really focusing on making sure that you're getting some sort of um, control of resistant uh, mare's tail. And these are the different combinations that you can use from a burn down standpoint in any soybean trait. Uh, the one thing I do want to point out is, um, you know, 240 ester has been extremely uh, effective uh, early in the season. What that does is it'll just give you control of what's up. Um, but remember that uh, we can only apply a pint of 240 ester, and we need at least seven days between then and prior to planting. One of the key things is now that we have some of these newer traits, we do have more options for burn down herbicides. So for example, in Roundup Ready to extend soybeans, we can use some of those registered dicamba formulations, whether it's Extendamax, Fexapan, or Ingenia, and those have really provided very good burn down control of mare's tail, and those combinations with some residual herbicides have done pretty well holding throughout most of the season. Another option that we have this year is the Enlist E3 soybeans. And with that, what we can do is now use 2,4-D, uh, a newer formulation, the choline salt, and that is uh, sold as Enlist 1, or the combination with glyphosate, and that's sold as Enlist Duo. But what we can use is higher rates of 2,4-D on these beans uh, with those particular formulations, and that can also help with 
some of uh, maybe some of the variable control that we've seen from a burn down side for uh, mare's tail. The other thing that I really want to point out is when we're talking about early season weed control, a lot of this, particularly when we start thinking about uh, mare's tail or horseweed, and then some of the pigweed species that we've been seeing, um, we really have three residual types of herb herbicides that we should focus on maybe trying to include in our soybean treatments. And first off would be um, from a mare's tail side, um, uh, metribuzin has probably been one of our most effective from a pre-emergence or soil applied side. There's a lot of premixes that have metribuzin in it. Um, two other herbicides, uh, the active ingredients, flumioxazin and sulfentrazone. Uh, these are group 14 herbicides. A lot of these have some different mixes with other products, including mixes with metribuzin. And those herbicides have worked really well to help control early season water hemp, uh, Palmer amaranth, giving us some early control of those, as well as um, helping with uh, mare's tail control. So um, kind of just giving you an idea of that these pre's are really important, making sure you're getting them into your soybean system, and that's going to help with some of those tougher to control weeds that we're seeing. And really some of those combinations of both uh, metribuzin and either flumioxazin or sulfentrazone, which are like the things like dimetric charge or trivents or fierce MTZ would have that for the uh, flumioxazin combinations or um, there's authority MTZ and a few others that we can use to um, maybe get some more consistent control. Uh, just to remind you, we do have kind of a step-by-step -step, uh, fact sheet out there looking at what herbicides are more effective for controlling a mare's tail. And again, you know, we're talking about early season weed control, but that goes hand in hand with looking at horseweed or mare's tail control because it is going to be such a problem this year. So that's in our weed control guide um, on page 220 if you have one of those. Um, it is also on our website, msuweeds.com, and I'll put that up in, uh, in a few minutes, but that you can access that fact sheet or also get to the weed control guide. And it really walks you through what steps, what rates, uh, what herbicides work the best. The other thing I do want to remind you of is, I'm, you know, I said these pre-emergence herbicides are really important. Um, with our soybean pre-herbicides, we need to make sure that we're making those applications before those soybean plants emerge. So we're talking about either a uh, pre-plant burn down or just after planting. Uh, in general, most of these herbicides, we want to make sure that we have on there within three days of planting. Um, uh, with this cool conditions, we might have a little bit more time, but again, that's one of those things we want to make sure that those soybeans are not poking through the soil surface and getting injury from some of those uh, residual products. So what about corn? Um, when we look at corn, a um, couple of things to remember. Starting clean again is extremely important, maybe almost uh, more important than with soybeans, and those residual herbicides are um, really a big component. Um, there is some differences with corn. Uh, we do have some soil applied residual herbicides that we can uh, apply after corn has emerged, and there is a really good table in the weed control guide. It's table 1H. And that really talks about what herbicides can be used and up to what stages. And it really talks about how you might be able to manage it. Let's say that corn is spiking through and you need to uh, make some of those residual herbicide applications. One other thing I want to mention before we leave is um, from a wheat standpoint, um, it has been cool. So, um, you know, there has been some wheat applications that have happened a little bit earlier when we had some warmer temperatures, but we're kind of running up against the clock couple things to consider. We want to make sure that those weeds are actively growing. We do not want to apply those herbicides when the crop is under stress. Um, when we do see that, we tend to see a lot more injury on the wheat. Kind of a good rule of thumb is really to apply those wheat herbicides when those daily temperatures are at least 50 degrees um, Fahrenheit or higher. So that's one kind of rule of thumb to go by. Um, we also, things to think about is we've got very limited spring options if we have frost seeded red clover. Um, we can use 28% as a carrier. A lot of times that's a kind of a 50-50 mix with water. Um, we have some good recommendations in the weed guide on that, as well as making sure that you consider both the wheat growth sides and the weeds controlled. Last week I had an article in the MSUE News that you can look up and it really 
walks through each one of these things. And just one quick reminder, we do have a, a new grass problem in wheat. Um, you can see the picture on the far right, and that's uh, rough stock bluegrass. That's kind of what we're seeing in some of our wheat fields where that's a problem. So um, it is a little bit further advanced than what we've seen over the last couple of years. And we have seen quite a bit of chickweed that has also been an issue. Um, so those are some of the things to consider. Uh, so just my last slide here, just remember, most of this information can be found on our website, msuweeds.com. You can just type that in. Um, and we also have the MSU Weed Control Guide posted on there in case you don't have a hard copy for yourself. So with that, I think I'm running up against a little bit of time, and I think we might have some time for questions. All right. Thanks, Christy. Uh, Phil asks, how long can we expect the residual herbicides to prevent horseweed problems? That's a really good question. Um, and a lot of it depends on uh, how uh, much of that is coming up later in the season. In general, we've tried to kind of focus getting those residuals out about seven days uh, before planting. And if we get good canopy closure, a lot of times we're seeing some pretty good results. But again, that's really looking at a good combination of making sure we have some metribuzin in there. And we've had, again, a little bit more consistent control when we can tank mix it with one of those group 14s. You mentioned that uh, 50 degrees for a daytime temperature was sort of a rule of thumb. Uh, can you talk a little bit about a couple things? Number one, about nighttime temperatures. And then also, what sort of a window do we have? So if we have uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday being you know ideal temperatures, uh, do I need to wait until then to spray? Or can I spray over the weekend knowing that the, the plants start to perk up by Monday? Um, I think one of the, the key things to remember is that um, you probably don't want to be spraying uh, coming out of a freeze or going into a freeze. So like if you're thinking um, at nighttime you're going to be below um, 32 either the night before or the day after, I'd probably wait until they're a little bit warmer. So that's, I guess that's kind of where I would um, be at and then really um, trying to make sure that those weeds and the wheat are actively growing because really what you need to do is have that wheat be able to metabolize some of those herbicides. Okay. Any concerns about herbicide carryover with all the late planted crops last spring? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I guess the one thing you need to think about is making sure that you revisit those rotation restrictions on some of those herbicides. Um, some of them could have more potential. Uh, for example, one that I'm thinking of would be something like uh, Flexstar or Reflex that might have been used in soybeans or dry beans later in the season. Um, and really that clock and far as the breakdown really needs to start early with some early moisture. And we're kind of like if you think about spraying um, those herbicides and rotating to corn, you really need to have 10 months. So if we're you know, kind of pushing that, you could potentially see some injury. So really re revisit those rotation uh, restrictions. We've got a nice table in the back of the weed control guide. I believe it's table 12. So I think that's really important to make sure that you're following those. Okay. Uh, the next one is, is a bit crop specific. Um, this person is asking, uh, what do you recommend for burning down an existing hay field consisting mostly grass and maybe 10% alfalfa? They'd like to replant to grass hay after first cutting. That one um, might be a good one to just go ahead and send me a quick email and um, we can uh, kind of discuss some of the options depending on what the, the grass is. So that might be probably the best way to handle that one. Okay, and I did have a question in here. Uh, someone was asking about the diagnostic clinic. Uh, are they shut down? And, and I responded to that in the chat, but uh, they are still open. Uh, both the soil and the diagnostic clinics are still open, but everything is via mail-in, or for the diagnostic, you can also email uh, pictures in, but no drop-offs at this point. I've got another question. Uh, for soybeans, uh, this person says they spray their burn down just before planting and it consists of glyphosate, Sharpen, Metribucin, uh, generic dual mag. Uh, this has worked well for them um, and they wait to do that in order to postpone a post application and they're just wanting to get a little feedback on, on that strategy. 
Yeah, that is that is actually a very good strategy. Um, again, you know, if we go too early with our burn down applications, um, we can kind of risk uh, having to uh, having more weed growth, especially with not planting um, and getting some uh, crop canopy out there earlier. So yeah, um, with those residuals and stuff, a lot of times we need to. Uh, you know, we usually like to say try to get it in there um, in that 7 to 14 day window before planting. So, yeah, that's a great, great strategy that you have. Okay. Uh, so this question is is maybe for our southern part of the state. The southwest uh, planted a pretty decent swath of early planted soybeans in mid-April. Any concerns about the pre-emergent herbicides with the continued cold weather on light soils? Yeah, um, I would expect that you're going to probably see um, some soybean entry, uh, particularly with a lot of the residuals that we do have, because um, with the cooler, uh, especially if you guys have been getting some uh, uh, moisture down there, um, you know, that, that can set those plants up for not metabolizing that. So you could potentially see some uh, some soybean entry. Again, the one thing that's really nice about soybeans, as long as you're not losing stand, um, quite a bit of those are able to uh, compensate later in the season um, with growth. So uh, hopefully it works out. I, I'd probably be a little bit more worried about some of the, <laughs> the cold damage. Okay, and Bruce also saying that tar spot has set up uh, for larger the number years on the ground from lodged corn last fall. Any thoughts on timing of spray to knock down volunteer corn this spring? Yeah, um, volunteer corn. So we do have options. Um, obviously, there's a lot of the post-grass herbicides, and you can find the whole listing in the weed guide. Um, uh, Timing-wise, in general, we want to make sure that that corn is up. And um, usually, we try to shoot for it to be around. That can be a little bit bigger than what we generally think of um, with our weeds. So um, generally, you know, six to 12 inches tall with the volunteer corn, um, we get pretty good uh, results. So it's just making sure that we get uh, most of that volunteer corn up when we add that application. And usually that can go in that first post application. And uh, Marty Chilvers put into the chat box for those of you who are interested in sending in uh, pictures to the diagnostic lab. He put in the uh, the URL for that, so you can get a little more information about that. So thanks, Marty. Uh, I do have one question that's actually related to wheat. So I know Dennis, uh, you're on. If I could have you answer this, um, Paul says he's seeing lots of purple wheat. Uh, if you could comment on that. Yeah. Good morning, uh, Eric and Paul. Uh, I've seen purpling on wheat as well, and what that is is a uh, temporary discoloring, uh, like a phosphorus, a temporary phosphorus deficiency. It has to do with the cool uh, soil temperatures and air temperatures. Um, what happens is you get, you know, still continue to get photosynthesis in the plant, um, but phosphorus is a key uh, component of transport of those photosynthates uh, back to the root system. So um, when you get reduced transport, uh, you get accumulated accumulation of some of those uh, purple pigments in the leaves. So when sun comes back out and temperatures warm back up and the soil dries out and warms up a little bit, uh, I would expect that to go away. I wouldn't expect there to be any significant yield loss from that. Okay, great. Thanks, Dennis. Got a note here from our field crop entomologist, Chris Defonzo. She says that uh, no black cutworms have been caught yet in her trap. She's got one single trap up in Williamston. Uh, here's another question for Christy. What kind of grass residual does Valor have? Um, it doesn't really have much grass residual, so um, I'd kind of put it on that uh, poor, <laughs> poor side. So you might see a little bit of setback at the beginning, but it's it definitely is not really much of a grass herbicide. Uh, but while we're waiting for questions, uh, just want to remind everyone that uh, in addition to the the live video this morning, we also have this recording that we posted on our Field Crops webpage. And you can also follow us on Twitter. And then we're also posting a podcast version of this. And you can see Spotify and Apple. Uh, and then also uh, we'll be on Facebook. So be sure to check us out there as well. Uh, just a couple more comments. Uh, Phil, uh, or excuse me, Paul Gross says that he had 11, 8, and 7 
black cutworms and a few traps that he has up in Isabella County. Um, Bruce says keep an eye out for uh, white grubs during tillage. Actually, had a lot of tillage uh, over the last couple of weeks here, uh, well into the, the a.m. hours in, in my area. Uh, Aaron Hill says a status update on herbicide resistance uh, can be uh, was highlighted in an article, and she's got a link to that article in the chat box. Uh, Charles has a question, or actually a comment, finding white grubs in southeast Michigan, um, checking for soybean emergence late last week, so uh, they have had some, some white grubs. Uh, once again, for uh, Christy and Jeff, thank you for your presentations. Uh, thank you everyone for joining, and we'll see you back here next week.